I was going to start with a, I was to start with a funny story and some jokes, but I'm going to just jump right into it. Because today we're talking from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 about holy living. And how do we live holy in an unholy world? Let, let's take a snapshot of where are we are as a, as a nation right now. Let's talk about our favorite baseball team. Well, not my favorite baseball team, your favorite baseball team. By the way, I'm a Braves fan. My guy right here has an Atlanta hat right here, which I love to see. And there's room for Dodger fans to become Braves fans right now. And <laughs> Braves fans do have a better record than the Dodgers. I don't want to rub that in too much right now. And I don't know that the Braves are God's team, but there's some evidence that it might be true. And so, but the, but the Dodgers, they invite, and not just invite, celebrate and award a group that isn't just about tolerance and inclusivity, they're about blaspheming the name of Jesus, mocking the cross and cruci— like, this is next-level mockery. Uh, we can't even go to our retail store because they're partnering with a transgender designer who is using satanic imagery and says, Satan respects pronouns, drawing a picture of a guillotine that says, this is a headrest for homophobes. It's no longer about tolerance, it's about domination. It's about saying, if you don't believe what I believe, then you are against me and you are now a bigot. Our own White House celebrates a Pride event recently where several transgender people go topless on our White House lawn. We just, in this state, had a, a law passed that uh, talking about potentially uh, ripping kids away from their parents if they don't affirm their kids' uh, gender. And, and the bill author used a seven-year-old as her example. And that is just the month of June. It is becoming increasingly harder to live purely and wholly in this world. And I can't imagine, as I was thinking about it this week, I was telling somebody that it is hard to raise kids in the world today. But can you imagine when our kids are raising their kids? It's becoming worse and worse and worse, and to live holy, to even read these words in a moment we'll do in 1 Peter 1, seems impossible in the world today. You watch a sporting event or a TV show, and you have to shield your kids' eyes from what's showing on in commercials. Our country is so divisive that no longer can we disagree, we now have to divide, and we're not even in an election here. It's becoming where if you post something online, you're, you're either a, a bigot or you're, uh, maybe you just are intolerant. Or if you name, we, we've de, uh, kind of uh, boxed ourselves in as a nation where you can basically celebrate anything except for the name of Jesus. We are intolerant of everything uh, uh, except for Jesus. How do we live purely and wholly in that world? C.S. Lewis, he's a uh, familiar author. Perhaps you've read some of his books. He has this, uh, he had this term of chronological snobbery, which the idea meant that people who lived in their time thought that their time was the worst time to live. So maybe people in the 1300s, I can't believe the world in this place. And we even see in, in Paul's writings that he thought the world was, was challenging. If you read the book of Judges, you'll find over and over that the people did that which was right in their own eyes. They did evil in the, against the Lord continually. And, and I bet, imagine people in the 1800s were like, kids these days, they don't churn butter as fast as they used to. Like, what is going on with the kids in our days today? And, and now we have in the 2000s, we have this world that has the, the world at their fingertips. And the world has always been challenging, but now we see it on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and we see the evilness and the unholiness of the world right at our fingertips. So how do we live holy in that world? You see on this, the walls here in our church following Jesus. How do you follow Jesus in a world that hates Jesus? Well, Peter offers us some advice and some tips in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have your Bible, I want to read a few verses with you, and you can turn over to the church app, and I want you to see these verses. They'll be on the screen as well, but here's what Peter writes, and he wrote this 2,000 years ago. Look what he says. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, 
you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. For the next few moments together, I want to share with you just three simple thoughts from this passage of how we can have holy living for unholy people in an unholy world. And I, my prayer is that this would be an encouragement to you. This is not a message just for dads. This is a message for all Christians, for people who follow Jesus. Because let me tell you, you are becoming an increasingly ostracized category of people in our world. So how do we follow Jesus in a world that hates Jesus? Well, the first thing I want to share with you is this. We find this in verse number 13. Holiness gets the mind right. It gets the mind right. It starts with the mind. Now, you may have had coaches yell at you growing up like, get your mind right, son. Get your head in the game. And we've heard all those things. And there's podcasts and books that are written and shared about how we can clear our mind and, and clean things up and not think about anything and do some breathing exercises. And some of those things are fine. God's word tells us we need to meditate on his word. But holiness begins in the mind. Too often we have this mentality that if we just do right, then we are right. But, but Peter reminds us, it says, hey, if you're ready for this, here's what you need to start with. With your minds ready for action, be sober-minded. But then he says this, set your hope completely on the grace of Jesus. And we find this idea that if we set our hope completely, what he's talking about is, he's, he says, hey, focus on Jesus and never change. Never let up. Never give in. You just focus on Jesus, and he's going to take care of the rest. Uh, virtual reality headsets are becoming more and more popular now, and Facebook and Apple and Sony are making all these. Could you imagine if we were to hook up a, a VR headset, and all of your thoughts about everybody popped up on a screen next to you? Some of you would be apologizing to people in the room. Some of you apologizing to the person next to you. Some of you would be apologizing to me. Like, there would be a lot of things that we would be apologizing for if we could, if we, all of our thoughts were scrolling by people. But here's the problem. We think if we think it, it's okay. But Jesus, he came in and he shattered that paradigm. I don't have time to get into all, but if you look at Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to talk about, hey, you, he talks about murder and adultery in particular. He says, hey, you didn't murder anybody this week? Good job. Like, gold star. Awesome. Hey, you didn't sleep with anybody that's not your spouse? Awesome. Good job. But then he asks a follow-up question. But do you hate anybody? Is there anybody that you can't forgive? Because in my kingdom, that is the same as murder. Oh, you didn't sleep with anybody physically today, but did you lust after her? Did you flirt with him? Are you having this, this emotional connection with them? Because that, in my book, is the same. And what he, Jesus is sharing with us, he's saying, hey, what happens in here is just as important as what happens with these. And too often we have this mentality as Christians that says, hey, if I go to church, if I maybe dress up a little bit, if I bring a Bible, if I give some money, if I give some time, if I serve, then I'm okay. And Jesus is like, well, hold on, hold on. It goes back a little bit further. Do you have your mind right? Are, 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 you live, are you thinking holy thoughts? This is why Christians have a bad rap when we, when we can appear to the world as the most unforgiving people in society. It's because we hold on to these thoughts. We're not allowing God to make our thoughts holy. Too often we have this mentality that we can just do what we want outwardly, uh, and, and kind of just make sure that we're kind of going with the flow, but inwardly we're just thinking how we want. But we find in Romans chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to this age. This was written 2,000 years ago before uh, the invention of social media. Don't be conformed to this age. Just because someone is posting that doesn't mean you need to follow up with that. And conversely, just because someone posts that doesn't mean you, you need to go on your rant against that either. I found Facebook is not a place for civil discussion. <laughs> But many times we have this idea that we're going to conform to society. And let me tell you, often this book is not guiding us. It's the news network. I am not your pastor. The news anchor is your pastor. And too many times we're conformed to this age. But then he goes on to say, but be transformed, to be changed. How? By the renewing of your mind, by changing your thought pattern so that you may discern what is the good, the pleasing and the perfect will of God. Those are three words that I would not describe our society right now. Good, pleasing, perfect, or complete will of God. 
And often we have this thing that we think, well, I can think whatever I want in here. As long as I don't do anything out there, then I'm okay. And Jesus is like, nope, you need to go back, get your mind right. And that's where holiness begins. But there's a second thought we find in verse number 14. Paul, uh, Peter rather, he goes on back to verse 14 and he says this. Has obedient children, do not be conformed. There's that word again. But then he says this, to the desires of your former ignorance. You see, if we're going to have holiness in our life as unholy people, then we must understand, number two, holiness recognizes that just because something is familiar doesn't mean it is fruitful. Now, there's a pretty wild verse in Proverbs. The writer in verse chapter 26 says this, Has a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. So the question is this, what is your foolishness? I was going to ask, what's your vomit? But that's too weird and graphic to like say. But what is your foolishness? What is that thing that you always find yourself going back to? For some of us, that's a toxic relationship. For some of us, we're staying in an abusive, a physically abusive marriage. We tolerate workaholic environments. We embrace backstabbing friendships. We give in to the life-draining co-workers. So some of you have dated or are dating someone that you know you need to break up with. They, they, don't, they don't give anything. They're just taking things. And, and, but it's familiar. It's, it's, it's who I know. It's, it's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable in. But often we have this mentality that, well, they're pretty close to what I'm looking for. It's pretty close to what I need in my life. And it's It's comfortable. My wife shared a story last week of, of her buying me some uh, fake Jordans, and I wanted to clean up a couple of things from the story. <laughs> I'm not going to retell the story. She told it well, but there's two things I need you to know. What, one, for the sneaker heads, my favorite Jordans are Jordan 12s. It's actually the shoes I'm wearing right now. The, these are legit ones, though. <laughs> but the second thing I need you to know is why I had a weird look when I opened up the shoes. Because I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, oh man, the church is going to think I'm so ungrateful that she bought these expensive shoes and I have this weird look. The reason I had this weird look is because I was looking at the Jordan logo and I was counting his fingers and I noticed there was not five, but six fingers on his, <laughs> on his hand. And that tipped me off of saying, thinking something is off about these shoes. So it wasn't that I wasn't grateful, it was I was counting fingers on the logo. Now, now here's, here's the interesting part about that, is that aside from the fingers, aside from maybe some stitching or some, some stiff, uh, maybe, materials, if you were, and I don't have them anymore, but if you were to hold up that shoe and this, uh, this legit shoe together from where you are, from watching online, they would look very close to being the same. You see, from afar off, even as Christians, we look very close to living out what Jesus has called us to. But when you, upon further inspection, when you began to look and count fingers or see stitching or see material, you're like, that is not real. But what about our life? Upon further inspection, our family is like, wait a second. You say you go to church. You say you love Jesus, but how is that playing out in your life? Because upon further inspection, your life looks just like mine, so why do I need the God that you say I need if he's not making a difference in your life? Here's the problem sometimes, is we have this mentality that if I look just close enough, it's, it'll pass the test. Now, there's not anybody here that's, in, that's at this church that's inspecting and, and, and kind of making sure that you're doing all these things, but you don't need a church to do that because you've got the Holy Spirit to be doing that in your own life. And, and what P Peter is re reminding us is, he's saying, hey, I know it's easier, it's more familiar to go back to what you know, but is that the best for what you're doing? Is that the best for your future? It, close enough in the Christian life is not good enough. That's why Jesus says there's going to be some people, there's going to be pastors, there's going to be church members, there's going to be Sunday school teachers, there's going to be missionaries and evangelists and prophets who proclaim the name of Jesus, Jesus says. But when they get to heaven, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You thought you knew me, and if you looked far away that you were, you were preaching in my name, but upon further inspection, 
you weren't the real thing. You see, often we have this mentality that if I can just do a few things, I'll get by. If I just give a little money, God will give me this. And it's like our own little heavenly ATM machine. If I can just do that, then God, you do this. But here's what it is. It's a conditional love. God, I'll serve you if you do this. And God's like, that's not the way it works. I give you unconditional love so that you can give unconditional love to other people. And it starts with in the mind, but it also continues with, hey, there might be some relationships, some friendships, some some things that, that habits that you've developed over the years that you need to get rid of because yeah, they're familiar, but they're no longer fruitful for you. And so let me encourage you. What is it in your life that you need to remove? There's one last thought we find here in verses 15 and 16, and this is where it really, if you thought this was like ramping up, no, it's gonna really ramp up in these next few verses. Because here's what Peter writes in verse number 15. Has the one who called you is holy. You also are to be holy in, and I hate this next word, you are to be holy in all your conduct. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, with Jesus guiding you, could you have just written some of your conduct? Could you have just written, be holy in, be holy in your Sunday conduct? Can you imagine if all we had to do as Christians was just come to church on Sunday, worship together, love each other, read God's word together, hear a word, and then we're done for the week? Sign me up for that. But that's not what the Christian life is. We don't just follow Jesus in this room. If we do, we're like that six-fingered Jordan shoe. (laughs) The problem sometimes is we have this mentality that I'll be holy in some of my conduct. Here's the third thought I want to share with you. Holiness is a 360-degree, 24-7 effort. And it is an effort. Following Jesus in today's age is, is challenging. But following Jesus in today's age is necessary. There are people that that, that they think, when we think of even this month of June, this Pride Month in our country, that really what, what, what we're being told is we're celebrating love, but it's that the world doesn't even know and understand what true love is. They think love says, hey, you just do what I want, and you affirm, and you celebrate everything that I want to do, but that's not what biblical love is. Love is saying, even if I disagree with you, I love you. E- even if you're going to, uh, Jesus says, hey, you love your enemies. You love those that spitefully use you. That is what love is. And so living for Jesus, living this holy life is a 24-7 effort. But if you thought verse 15 was bad, Peter levels it up again in verse 16. Because in verse 15, he says, hey, you need to be holy in all of your conduct. Ah, great. And then he pulls the God card. Because in verse 16, he says this, for it is written... And he's referencing a verse in Leviticus where God tells the people of Israel, he says this, be holy. Why? Because I am holy. Oh, man. I have to be holy in all my conduct and I have to imitate God? Like, this is impossible. Yeah, it is. It is. We have the Holy Spirit helping us and shaping us and guiding us. But this is a struggle that's going to be with our whole life 360 degrees, everywhere we are, 24-7. But I want to point you to John chapter 16. This is Jesus speaking. He's preaching there to these disciples, and here's what he says. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But look what he says next. You will. This is another word that I wish was not in the Bible. I wish it said, you might have suffering. (laughs) Maybe once in your life you'll have a couple of suffering days, but that's not what he says. He says, you will have suffering in the world. But look what he says next. Be courageous, for I have conquered the world. I love this. Uh, they actually did a study. Uh, I, may, I don't know if this is you or not, but uh, they did a study years ago. I think it was maybe University of Cal Berkeley. Uh, they did a study where they, uh, people would often go to the end of a book 
read it first, and then they go to the beginning and then read the whole thing. And people were like, that is so weird. Like, why would you know the ending and then go back to the beginning and read it? And they did this study that people that did that actually enjoyed the book more because they knew what would happen. Now, that's my kind of style. I hate surprises. I hate surprises. And so I, I, I haven't done this, but I get why people would do that. And I say that for this. We've read the end of the book. We, if you didn't know this, spoiler alert, we win. We win. So here's the point. It is difficult now to follow Jesus. It seems like the world is tolerant of everything except the name of Jesus. And it's going to be harder to post uh, scriptures. It's going to be harder to bring a Bible to work or, or pray over a lunch or have a testimony for Jesus or live a holy life. It is challenging. Jesus reminds us, you will have suffering. But here's the good news. You are on the winning side. Jesus is going to come. He's got the last at bat. He has a plan in place, and you and I will win. So what do we do in the meantime? We live holy. To the best of our ability, in all of our conduct, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 degrees of our life, every day of the week, we live holy lives, and we allow Jesus to bring us the victory. This past week, I was working on a, a project at home. I was staining some wood, and I, I needed a bowl to kind of soak and clean some things. And I don't have any bowls in the garage. Like, I just don't carry bowls in the garage. But you know where bowls are? In the kitchen. <laughs> now, I, I was trying to be sneaky this week of trying to get a bowl in without uh, Amy knowing, because this is not my first offense. Uh, she was reminding me this week. And there's been lots of things that I have ruined over the years. And so I, I was, uh, I had this bowl and I was getting some stain in it, but I was like, I can, I can clean it off. I can get it out and I'll do it before she even knows. She won't even know the difference. And so I'm getting it in and all of a sudden this bowl just got spot after spot after spot. And I'm scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and is not coming off. Sweat's pouring down. I'm like, oh man, like this is not good. I've ruined dish towels. I didn't even know what dish towels were. I just thought it was a towel or I thought it was a rag, really. That, that's a whole, that's another message that like, we've got to get into that later. I don't have time for that right now. And so I, I got this bowl and I realized that I was not going to be able to clean this bowl and get rid of all the stains. And so I did what I've done multiple times before. I went on Amazon to find a replacement bowl. I think I found the same bowl She's not sure if it's the same one, and I won't tell you what she said when she saw this bowl being ruined. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I found this bowl, and it's going to cost me $15 to replace this bowl. Now, here's where it pertains to us. You see, this was a $15 mistake. But when we don't live purely in our life, when we allow the world to stain us, it's far greater than a $15 bowl. You see, unholiness in our life will often cost us our marriage. Unholiness in our life will often cost us our relationship with our kids. It will cost us a job promotion at work, or it will cost us some things in our life that are much greater than a $15 bowl. You see, I can go on Amazon and buy another bowl, but you can't go on Amazon and buy another life. You can't buy a past, or you can't buy a moment that, that you just allowed the world to stain you, that you were not living holy. Now, the stakes are greater than my DIY project. The, the stakes are, are, are much higher than replacing a kitchen bowl or a towel. The stakes are our life, our kids, our testimony, someone's eternity. The stakes are great, and that's why Peter says, hey, be holy as I am holy. God's upping the stakes for you and I, and he says this, you're going to have suffering, and this is a crazy world. Sometimes I, I, I used to ask, uh, is Jesus coming again? But now I ask, did Jesus already come and I missed the rapture? Like, is, is this the end of the world? Like, is this as bad as it gets? But I think the answer is no, it's going to get worse. And so what does that mean? It means I cling to the Bible. It means that we will be people of the word, not people of the news. It means that we allow his principles to guide us. It means that we, on our wall, 
follow Jesus no matter the cost. And so how do we live holy in an unholy world? We follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we're up for our time together? I want to I want to give those who follow Jesus a moment of reflection and this is not a message specifically for dads and it wasn't even really what I was planning on to be honest with you. But it was a word I know that the Lord brought and gave to me. Perhaps you're sitting here and you're like, "Man, I I get persecuted at work. I get mocked." maybe even in my home or in my neighborhood or with my extended family. I want you to know that while you feel like you're losing right now, you are on the winning side. I get maybe your baseball team is doing things that you don't agree with or your store that you like to go to is promoting a lifestyle that you don't agree with and I feel like often that our politicians are not representing maybe what the people are do, are wanting and and they're leading wrong and there's a lot of challenges in our culture and society today but let me encourage you we can control what we can control and that is the way we live and we live holy perhaps you're sitting here and maybe it's your first time and you're like whoa like this was a little bit more intense than I was expecting i want you to know and i hope you heard that God loves you and that there is a real love in this place. We're trying to maneuver and figure out how to navigate life in a world that is very complicated. But we always go back to scripture. And so perhaps you're sitting here or maybe you're watching with us online and you've never done what we have on our wall of follow Jesus. You've never in your life said, "God, would you please forgive me of my wrongdoing? Would you please come into my life and save me? Forgive me?" We're going to make it an opportunity for you now. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come forward or any of that. I just want to pray with you and ask you in just a moment to just simply raise your hand. I won't embarrass you or ask you to call out your name. But if you're in this room and you say, "Pastor Jeremy, I've never said yes to God. I've never asked him to forgive me, but I want to follow him today." If that's you, would you do me the honor of simply raising your hand? I just want to pray with you and agree with you. Anybody in this room at all would say, "Pastor Jeremy, would you Would you pray with me? I want I want to say yes. I see you. What a great decision that you're making. I appreciate your honesty and your boldness. I see you over here. I thank you for your honesty. I see you all the way in the back. Thank you for that boldness. I see you too. I see you all the way up here. What a great decision that you're making. If you're watching online, you can join the many hands that were raised in here and pray something along these lines. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner. But would you forgive me? Would you come into my life and clean me from the inside out and help me to follow you? Thank you for this gift of salvation. And I pray this in Jesus name. Amen.